My name is Amit Bendre. As convener of Western Regional Chapter of Amtoy, I extend a warm welcome to roughly 250 and all attendees who have joined this webinar today. I sincerely welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Jagannathan Muttu, who has joined for us from Singapore. Honorable President of Amtoy, Mr. Shantanu Badgamkar, and co-convener WRC Amtoy, Mr. Vasan Patak. Before I introduce each of these panelists, let me take you through today's topic. This topic does not need any introduction as this topic contains most important three words in the life of a freight forwarder. Today we are going to deal with this grand old term used in shipping more frequently than any other, the term bill of lading. BL as we can call it or in short, or we call it in short, is a term used for more than 600 years. While the history of shipping itself is very exciting, so is the progress made by this document in the history of international trade. Since its humble origins, BL is used as a receipt of goods on ship to the electronic form that it's expected to take in near future. The BL has evolved dynamically as per the trade requirement and available technology. As members of Amtoy, most of us are registered MTOs with DG Shipping. We have been certified to issue our own bill of lading. We all take a lot of pride in mentioning this in our company introduction and in our sales pitch to our clients. As freight forwarders, as MTOs, our bill of lading with our logo creates our brand. It creates our image in the local and international marketplace. It carries our brand and image globally. When we release our bill of lading to a shipper, we are not only engaging in contract with shipper and consignee as a carrier, but we also engage our overseas agent for issuing delivery of goods at destination. To have good knowledge of our role as a carrier, as a principal, as an agent of the principal, and to be aware of the risk and responsibilities as issuer of the bill of lading becomes very crucial for the basic existence of our business as a freight forwarder. Having said this, I take immense pleasure to introduce our eminent speaker, Mr. Jagannathan Muttu, popularly known as Jagan. He has more than 25 years of experience in various facets of shipping and international trade. He is the founder of consultancy firm that handles various marine related claims. Jagan is a panel arbitrator at various institutions, including the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, China Maritime Arbitration Commission, Emirates Maritime Arbitration Center, Asian International Arbitration Center, and the Indian Council of Arbitration. Jagan frequently lectures on shipping, marine insurance, and related matters at various forums. In his free time, he writes regularly on transport, merit, insurance, dispute resolution, and related matters. He has also written articles in Amtoy Quarterly News Magazine. Our second eminent panelist is Mr. Santanu Badkamkar, who is president of Amtoy. He is a member on the court of Indian Maritime University and National Shipping Board. Sir, I welcome both of you on behalf of the attendees. And with this, I hand over to Mr. Jagan to make his presentation. And friends, after we finish the presentation, I am sure both our panelists will be glad to answer your questions, which you are requested to send using the Q&A tab, question and answer tab on the bottom of your screen. Jagan, over to you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for your very kind words. Let me just share my screen so that I can put my PowerPoint presentation. Give me a second, please. I believe you all can see my uh, screen. No, I just... Yes, I think you all can see my screen now. Uh, yes. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Everybody. Uh, first of all, I must thank Amtoy for organizing this webinar and inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, as Amit said, there are quite a lot of participants. Obviously, it does put pressure on someone to speak to so many people. 
uh, but I shall try my best to, to touch on this topic. I am, as you are probably aware, based in Singapore and involved in dealing with shipping and related disputes in and around this region. Uh, this topic is, you know, like, like Amit says, is an evergreen topic. Everyone involved in shipping as a freight forwarder, as a shipping agent or a line uh, would, would, would be knowing about it. And it has come into prominence, uh, prominence due to this recent COVID pandemic. This is, as you are aware, is probably due to the difficulties in the recent past for the issue and surrender of bills of lading. During the next 45 minutes or so, I will speak on this topic and subsequently, I would be happy to answer questions along with my co-panelists, anything which may be raised. Given that the majority of the past participants are from the liner industry, logistics industry, my presentation is slanted more towards them. However, bills of lading are also used in the bulk and break bulk shipping and most of the content of what I'm going to speak would be uh, common for both. If you look at history, you know, uh, how did this term lading come into effect or, or what does this lading mean? Lading comes from the 15th century verb uh, to lade, which meant then what to load means today. In the very olden days, merchants used to travel with the cargo uh, along with the ship to various destinations to sell their cargo. It was basically an adventure. Once the cargo was loaded on board the vessel, details were, loaded, uh, were noted in the book of lading so that the merchants could contribute to freight once the cargo was sold at destination. Around the 14th century, owners were issuing a non-negotiable receipt for cargo received to a merchant who did not intend to travel with these goods. It would contain a statements as to the type and quantity of goods shipped and to the condition in which they were received. Subsequent experience led to the inclusion of the terms of the contract of carriage in order to resolve disputes which inevitably arose between cargo owners and carriers. Finally, by the 18th century, the bill of lading acquired its third characteristics of being negotiable by endorsement in order to meet the, the needs of the merchants who wish to dispose of the goods before the vessel reaches destination. What I intend to do is to speak basically on these four topics related to the bill of lading, namely the functions of the bills of lading, uh, its role in international sale contract, common clauses for both bulk and liner trade, I will also touch some of the uh, other clauses you generally see in the liner industry and general issues which we may face with, liner, with, with bills of lading more in the liner industry. I must confess that there are tomes and tomes of literature written on this topic together with sufficient case law which have developed over the centuries. Hence, in the limited time we have, I will only touch on some of the aspects of the bills of lading. So the first thing we need to look at is what are the functions of the bills of lading. Uh, one of the main functions, it acts as a receipt. As I mentioned earlier, once the merchants stopped traveling with their goods, they needed a document which would state the details and quantity of goods loaded together with the condition of the goods. This became the receipt function. The receipt function has particular importance when a cargo claimant wishes to claim uh, from you know the carrier if there is a you know damage to the cargo. If uh, uh, you know uh, if the cargo is, is damaged, then the carrier should you know actually issue a, a clause bill of lading or he should actually mention that there is damage to the cargo, so that should someone actually pursue them for recovery, you know they could deny it because at the time of receiving the cargo they actually had received damaged cargo. Uh, between, you know, when the bill of lading is transferred to a third party, the document, you know, the carrier would be stopped from denying whatever he has been mentioned in the bill of lading. So he would be responsible if he provides any damaged cargo when the bill of lading does not state there's any damaged cargo. In the container industry, there is a bit of a twist because most of the times the carriers do not see what is inside the container, especially if shipments are affected on a full container load. As the carrier has no knowledge of the quantity and quality of goods, they would generally you know, mention a clause in the bill of lading set to contain, set to measure, which, which basically means that the carrier has no knowledge of what exactly inside the container. 
and he takes it on the basis of whatever has been disclosed or, or, or whatever has been told by the shipper. In the case of, of bulk industry, it is not the case because the carrier has an opportunity to view the cargo. And therefore, you know, uh, uh, what would happen is if the cargo is, is, is loaded in good condition, you will generally say clean on board, which signifies that the cargo is in sound order. Whereas in the container industry, don't see it. There is, you know, in my view, there should be no clean bills of lading issued in the container industry. So the first function, as I said, it basically acts as a receipt. The second function, it acts as a document of title. The BL's role as a document of title is actually threefold. Uh, the bill of lading is akin to a key to a warehouse, a floating warehouse. Uh, the common law duty of the carrier is to deliver the cargo to the holder of the original bills of lading. Unless there is a special custom in the port of destination or an express agreement to the contrary. Uh, in case the bill of lading is a negotiable bill of lading, there must be a valid endorsement to the holder to take delivery. The BL, by, by saying the BL is a negotiable document, what I mean is it is transferable. And the way it is done is by endorsing the BL until someone takes, decides to take delivery. In some cargos, especially oil cargos, you will find that the, the endorsement will continue for quite some time. In other cargos, you might find that, you know, there's only one buyer, so that endorsement might not be a very important function. And the BL also acts as security for payment of freight. Uh, the way I probably say it is, if the bill of lading is a freight prepaid bill of lading, then the carrier will not release the, the bill, bill of lading to the shipper unless the freight has been paid. Uh, in case the bill of lading is a freight collect, what would happen is that the carrier would collect the freight before releasing the cargo to the consignee. Uh, obviously, if there is a separate agreement between the carrier and the cargo interest, that's a different thing. The third and most, uh, you know, uh, uh, the third and, and the last function of the bill of reading is basically an evidence of a contract of carriage. The reason why I state that it is an evidence of contract of carriage is invariably the contract is formed much before the issue of the bill of reading. By convention, a bill of lading is actually issued when it has been loaded or when the vessel sails. I'm talking of where you issue bills of lading, where there are ports, where, where it is loaded in a port. I am aware that when the cargo is loaded, let's say in an in a hinterland, it might be a different practice. But in which case, when the bills of when you want to put a ship on board, you would probably you know endorse it on the day when it has been loaded. Uh, but before the loading, there is going to be discussion between the carrier and the cargo interest to discuss on what they want. This being the case, the bill of lading is only an evidence of a contract of carriage between the original parties. And the case in point is the Ardennes, where uh, the claimant was exporting mandarin oranges from Spain to London. The, uh, the claimant actually uh, you know, wanted uh, the, the carrier, uh, the, the cargo to arrive in London by 1st December. Uh, to avoid paying an increased import duty. And the, the, the contract which he had with the carrier had an express clause stating that the vessel would sail direct to London. However, the vessel went to Antwerp first and did not arrive in London until 4th December, thus leading to the shipper paying this import duty which he wanted to avoid. The claimant pursued the carrier for the breach of, of contract given that the carrier deviated. In their defense, the carrier denied the claim given that their bill of lading had a liberty clause entitling them to deviate. The court ruled in favor of the claimants given that the contract was actually formed prior to the issue of the bills of lading. The reason why I'm trying to, to talk about the Ardennes is, is the bill of lading between the original parties is only an evidence. And if you find that this is something which you're not agreed, you could always rectify, you could always request the other party to rectify the terms. If it is not possible, you can go to court. But when the bill of lading is endorsed to a third party, it becomes the contract of carriage. The reason being is that the third party has no knowledge of the previous discussions between the original parties and he buys the, the cargo on the basis of bills of lading, which is shown. So, so the endorsee takes the bills of lading at face value and then you know, he could not, you know, the carrier say, listen, that is it's an evidence. Moving on to, to the trade transaction, the bills of lading you know, comes into force as it facilitates trade. 
In the conventional sale of cargo, one would generally have to have physical possession of cargo prior to making a sale. However, in the case of cargo being transported by sea, one can sell cargo without having physical possession of the cargo as long as he is a BL for the cargo. That is why you find that most of the international sales are done on documents. Uh, while parties can agree to make payment uh, before in advance or delivery, the fact is, given that parties are in, are, are in two different jurisdictions, they are generally wary, and they would instead prefer to make payment once they have the goods or the symbol of the goods, the BN. In so far as the shipper or the trader is concerned, you know, as long as they have provided a clean bill of lading or a bill of lading with no exceptions, they have performed their part of the bargain with respect to the sale contract. And if the consignee is delivered or misdelivered or is delivered damaged cargo, he should pursue the carrier for his loss. So, you know, if the consignee cannot claim from the shipper, listen, I got damaged goods. If the bills of lading are, does not show there's any damage, uh, the shipper or the exporter has performed his part of the bargain and it's left to the consignee to then talk to the carrier to sort out his claim, so to say. I have a simplified diagram which basically shows a, a let, letter of credit transaction. Uh, firstly, you would find a buyer and, and, and seller have a, a sale of contract uh, goods, uh, you know, a, a contract of international sale of goods, which would provide for relevant documents to be submitted and which would include the bills of lading. Once the cargo is shipped, the shipper will then, you know, uh, submit it to the buyer's bank for payment. The buyer's bank will check the documents and if it is in conformity to the letter of credit, will make payment to the seller. In turn, the bank will advise the buyer that they have the documents available so that the buyer can make payment and collect the same. Once the vessel arrives in destination, the buyer will deliver the documents to the shipping line or his agent and collect the cargo. I am sure you will be aware that there will be other subsidiary contracts in this transaction. Uh, like insurance, marine insurance for cargo, inspection, etc. But I have not included to keep this diagram, you know, to keep it simple. I move on to the common clauses in a bill of lading. But before I actually touch on clauses, I thought I list out the main boxes bill of lading. I have not put uh, an image of a bill of lading, knowing fully well that I have. Uh, parties from different carriers, so it would not be fair to actually put one carrier's bill of lading to, to play have a level playing field. So, and since all of you are dealing with this, you would have seen it, but I thought, you know, I will touch on only the important clauses which I feel we should look at. Uh, I will touch on the signature clause because, you know, uh, uh, given that most bills of lading, if you look at the, the obverse size, would generally have an identity of carrier clause or a demise clause. And therefore, once you have a claim, the cargo interest or an underlying party would may have an issue to ascertain whom they are contracted with. The English Lord, House of Lords case, the Star Sin, decided that irrespective if the bill of lading has an identity of carrier or demise clause, one must look at the face of the bill of lading to ascertain who the carrier is. What is the logo on the face of the BL? On what capacity has the bill of lading has been signed? and who has been named as a carrier. Previous to the star sin, it was quite possible for owners to try and defend the claim, saying that they are not the parties, uh, saying that the party is actually the owner or the vessel which has chart been chartered by demise. So things have changed by this case, in which case uh, someone would look, need to look at the face of the bill of lading. If you have a logo, if it's signed by the carrier, for and behalf of the carrier, that is the carrier you need to pursue uh, to try and, and, and there is a claim. Obviously, this decision stops the merry-go-round for the cargo interest when they wish to submit their claim for payment to the carriers. Uh, I, I thought I would also touch on the house BLs and master BL at this point of time. I think I wanted to make this emphasis that any BL which has a logo, yes, that in my view is a house BL. I think the industry is perhaps in my view, I am happy to be corrected if someone would like to correct me on this, is, is, is making a reference to house bill and master BL because these are two separate contracts for two separate parties and the contracts are never back to back. 
my view is, you know, in so far as the overlying carrier, which some parties call the master BL, uh, it would be better explained as an overlying contract between, uh, 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 let's say, a forwarder uh, who's acting as a contractual carrier and which may or may not require the issue of a BL. Uh, you know, you can talk of an MBO CC who can take a slot charter. He might not be issued a bill of lading or if he's issued a bill of lading, it's only issued for a receipt function. I would be happy to expand on this during the question and, time, question and answers time, if time permits. I thought I'd touch on the common clauses and I have taken the six common clauses which you find in the six clauses which you find in Congen 2016, which is issued pursuant to a GenCon charter party. Uh, in, in so far as the liner bill of lading is concerned or a multimodal transport of, if for that matter, you know, uh, bills of lading which are being issued by MTOs uh, like uh, members of, of Amtoy, I would assume they would have more than 18 to 25 clauses. So there are so many clauses which are there. But if you look at charter party clauses, they would generally not be so much. I will start by focusing on the congen BL and in, in the first clause does provide, you know, uh, a look at uh, to ensure that the charter party is, is incorporated so that, you know, the owners or the carrier has the benefit of the provisions of the charter party. In so far as the charter party is concerned, there is freedom of contract and parties to a charter party can decide anything without any legislation or any compulsory convention applying to it. But when it comes to a bill of lading, there may be issues. So therefore, if you want to take you know, some provisions which you want, which are beneficial in the charter party, you need to do it. So they would provide for specific incorporation of a specific charter party so that uh, the owners or in, in the charter may take benefit. The next clause is generally the paramount clause, which, which will provide for incorporation of the Hague or hague Bisbee rules if it is not compulsory applicable. Invariably, uh, most of the countries have signed for some compulsory cargo conventions, uh, like the Hague rules or the hague Bisbee rules, the Hamburg rules, and the newest kid, uh, the Rotterdam rules. Uh, so what happens is if they do not have any of these conventions, then only common law would apply. And common law is not so beneficial to carriers. They would still prefer that, to, that they contract on the basis of the compulsory cargo conventions like the hague Bisbee rules. So what happens is what the paramount clause does is if none of these conventions are compulsory applicable, then the hague Bisbee rules would apply to govern the contract of carriage. The advantage of doing this, at least for the carriers, is that uh, the requirement of absolute obligation as provided in common law to make the vessel seaworthy at the beginning of the voyage is changed to one of exercise due diligence at the beginning of the voyage. Subject to fulfilling this requirement and requirements in Article 3.1 and 3.2, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, requirements of due diligence and continuous care of cargo, uh, a carrier would be entitled to exclude or limit liability on Article 4.2a to q. I will touch on that in a later slide. The hague Bisbee rules also provides for responsibilities to the carrier. So obviously this is, you know, it, it tries to circumvent it so that the hague Bisbee rules is compulsory applicable in so far as a contract of carriage is concerned. There is also a clause for gender leverage. There is no compulsory application of gender leverage. Uh, uh, there is no convention which is there. So it is applied by, 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 by contraction incorporation. The latest rules are the York and Firk rules 2016, uh, which, uh, you know, which will be used to adjust any gender leverage. But it takes time to get these rules in. So most of the bills of lading which I have seen in the recent past do provide for York and Firk rules 1994 to adjust it. GA is basically uh, defined in, in Rule A of the York and Firk rules, which I have listed in the slide. I'm not going to read it across, but basically you require five requirements. They, uh, one is extraordinary sacrifice or, or expenditure, intentional, uh, reasonable. Uh, there, there needs to be a peril and it has to be a common maritime adventure. Then you have a new JSON clause. Uh, this is because US law has developed differently and that owners are not entitled uh, to claim for GA if it is due to their fault, which is excusable. Uh, in order to avoid this, you have a clause allowing owners to circumvent this aspect or carriers to circumvent this aspect, allowing them to seek contributions for excusable fault. 
Then you again have a vote to blame clause. Again, US, US is, is a wonderful country, but their law has developed, even though it's a common law country, uh, for most parts, there is also civil law in that Louisiana state is actually a civil law jurisdiction. They have developed differently and they do not actually follow the same thing what English law, the other common law jurisdictions are following. Why do you require it? Because of the Milan rule, the cargo being carried on board a vessel is considered to have the same fault as the carrying vessel. But, uh, you know, in the case of US, uh, you know, it would, that would not be the way. It would be the way of what a passenger or a crew could claim. So if a cargo wants to claim from the carrying vessel, invariably, the carrier would be entitled to defend the claim. And that is the reason the cargo interest would try to pursue the other person who may be at fault when there is a collision. And uh, since the apportionment of liability is not as in the Milan rule, they are entitled to claim for 100% of the losses from the other vessel. In turn, the other vessel will try and claim from the carrying vessel uh, for their apportionment. And what would happen is the carrying vessel would find that even though they have a difference against their you know, cargo, which, is, which they are carrying, they would need to pay. To circumvent this, they, they try to ensure that, listen, you know, they, the, the cargo interest will indemnify if they, have, you know, uh, if, 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 if they, they pay their portion. So it's try to avoid this. You have this clause so that uh, the, the, car, the carrier can seek recovery from their cargo interest. Then you have the Himalaya clause is basically uh, uh, actually beneficial in the sense that uh, the parties a uh, 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 contractor or subcontractor can take advantage of it. It arose from a, a case known as Adler and Dixon on the, the name of the vessel was the Himalaya, where a master and bosun were held liable to a passenger who fell due to faulty rigging of the gang plank. The injured lady discovered that she could not claim damages from the owners by virtue of the wordings of the passenger ticket. She then successfully sued the captain and the errant bosun in tort. In order to avoid such claims, owners included a clause worded in the form of today's Himalaya clause in all passenger tickets and BL. The hague Visby rules has a Himalaya clause for their servants and agents, but the Hague rules do not have. But you have to note that the hague Visby rules only allow protection for servants and agents. They do not provide protection for third parties like terminals or, or, or subcontractors. And that is the reason when, when you have a subcontractor, they would like to take benefit of the contract of carriage exclusions and limitations. And they will say, listen, we need a Himalaya clause to give this protection. You would find the bills of lading have a Himalaya clause and this is there. Now we move on to the liner bills of lading where there are lots of other clauses. I'm not, not going to touch on everything. I'm only going to touch on some of these clauses. What is liner? Basically, it means regular advertised service. Carrier will call and depart irrespective if, this, if there is sufficient cargo or not. Uh, one of the common clauses you'll find is freight clause. Basically provides that the carrier uh, is, the freight is earned on loading irrespective if the carrier is not able to do. Under common law, freight is only earned on right and true delivery. The case in point is Daikin and Oxley. So in case if there is loss or damage to the cargo during the voyage, and you do not have any specific contract in the bills of lading, the cargo interest could deny the entitlement of freight because they have not been delivered the cargo. But however, by having this clause, what the carrier says is the freight is already earned on loading. In, it may be that the freight would, could have been paid or is paid a later date, but the freight is already earned at that point. Irrespective of the cargo is delivered or not, the carrier is entitled to freight. There is the lien clause because under common law, a carrier is only entitled to hold lien for uh, uh, unpaid freight, general leverage and salvage. However, there would be other contractual charges which could have been arising. That is, you know, damage and retention, in, at least in the container industry, uh, return of container is delayed uh, uh, if, if there are any damage charges. So you could have this provision in the contract allowing the carrier to hold lien for unpaid charges contractually. Otherwise, under common law, you're not entitled to do so. Shipments are done internationally from one port to another port. And, and therefore, you would generally have bills of lading which does provide for a specific law and jurisdiction. The first question is what law applies to the bills of lading? 
if there is a specific law mentioned in the bill of lading obviously that would be what the law of the contract of carriage would be having said that if you do a shipment from say india uh, the indian coxa would compulsory apply for shipments out of india if the provisions are fulfilled or let's say in the multimodal act if the provisions of multimodal act are fulfilled uh, that does not mean that it also applies to the law of the contract and i'm aware that some jurisdictions if you go if you go and, and, and initiate an action they would not be willing to consider that but in most of the jurisdictions they may accept that the law of the contract is what has been agreed this is because you know invariably shipping contracts are between two parties it's transnational in nature with two international parties dealing with it what about dispute resolution again most of the bills of lading do not provide for a specific if they do not provide for a specific jurisdiction you need to try and find out what is the right jurisdiction the hague and hague bisby rules do not have any specific provision as far as jurisdiction for hearing the claim is concerned uh, the the hamburg rules and the rotterdam rules too has some specific provisions which could be of assistance but as i you know as the hague and hague bisby rules are what is invariably used so you may actually provide for a specific jurisdiction to hear your claim so to say uh, some jurisdictions are not comfortable with accepting it but if you decide to deal your, your dispute resolution by other processes such as arbitration they are more happy to accept it for example my understanding is the uae will not basically agree to to jurisdiction clauses but they are happy to allow um, uh, claims to be arbitrated if there's an arbitration clause uh, as an aside perhaps this is something which amtai could consider whether arbitrations are the way forward uh, the reason why i'm touching on arbitration specifically is they do arise there are a lot of claims which do arise if you go to the court processes they are pretty slow they may be costly and and and, and the wound or the claim may fester for a long time uh, 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 an arbitration procedure uh, can actually ameliorate it can be done much more faster much more cheaper and parties could be more satisfied by this the aim is not to fight the aim is to find a solution and 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 and, and people are aware how to to deal with their issues what about the period of the contract the hague or hague bisby rules only applies from the time of loading till the time of discharge arguably if anything happens before the loading or after the discharge the hague bisby rules should not apply uh, so you know the time bar which is provided in the hague or hague bisby rules which i am going to touch in the, the next this thing is is a shorter period but if you do not have that then you may have a longer time period so which might not be so much good for 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 the carriers that is the reason you know uh, the, the line of bill, bills of lading generally extend the period right from the time they come into control till the time they give discharge they say that let's let's continue and extend the provisions of the hague bisby rules all throughout or for this before and after period they have a nine month time bar and with a limitation of liability which is similar to the hague bisby rules for the period outside uh, the hague bisby rules the third way to deal with this carriers may decide that listen they are only liable for the portion which they perform for the portion before and after they subcontract out and they act as agents for the shippers so so you know you can you could look at the period of contract and you could look at where the damage happened and what the liability occurs i have been talking about the hague and hague bisby rules again uh, uh, that is a separate topic by itself but but for the purpose of the for the bills of lading it is pretty important because they compulsory apply invariably in almost all of the jurisdictions uh, there are provisions for exclusions under article uh, 48 uh, 428 to q including the fault in the management of the ship the nautical exception which you know uh, the cargo interest do not like but that's the way it is in order for a carrier to be entitled to the exclusions which are available he needs to fulfill two parts that is article 31 which is exercise due diligence at the beginning of the voyage and uh, article 32 which basically means continuous care of the cargo if he is entitled to do it he is entitled to exclude liability under the provisions a to q so he has some things which which he can say listen i am not liable even if it is my fault in the event they are not able to to exclude liability the carrier is entitled to limit liability so uh, the hague rules provides for 100 british pounds uh, 100 british pounds today's date is not so much but there is a bit of a thing because the hague rules provide for the gold value 
So the case, the Rosa, you know, uh, uh, took decision on this. So 100 British pounds is somewhere about US thousand, eight thousand dollars of the gold value. What what was the time when when UK signed this 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 convention? In the case of the Hague or Hague Bisbee rules, there is both a package limitation and a, a, a weight limitation, whichever is higher. It is two SGR per kg uh, or 666.67 SGR per package. Uh, I checked the value of SDR. SDR stands for special drawing rights. It's basically a, a, a basket of currencies which the UN keeps so that you can try to ameliorate the risk of inflation. Uh, the SDR on 19 June was approximately one SDR was 1.378. Uh, USD, which you can work out is about 2.76 uh, USD per kg or uh, $920 per, per package. Uh, in the case of the Hague, Hague rules, limitation cannot be broken. It is very strong difference. In the case of Hague Bisbee rules, it could be broken if the carrier, if it could be proved that the carrier was reckless. Now, this has to be done by the cargo interests. Very difficult, but yes, it could be done. Then you have a time bar provision in the sense of one year. The Hague and Hague-Bisbee rules provide for one year. The Hague-Bisbee rules has got another provision for the, the 636 bis that if there is an indemnity carrier, that means if there is an overlying carrier, uh, someone pays a claim, he has an additional three months to pursue the claim. The last part is, can you try to put any clause in the contract which can limit whatever is provided in the Hague or Hague-Bisbee rules? Article 3.8 of the Hague Bisbee rules clearly provides you cannot do it. You know, any clause which tries to little or reduce is null and void. So those clauses are of no use. So you need to look where does the Hague and Hague Bisbee rules apply. As long as they apply, you know, that is the minimum. It does not prevent the carrier from giving more, but it does prevent the carrier from giving less. So that is what you need to look at. Anything outside, you know, common law applies or if any compulsory act applies. So that is the way the, the, you look at the bill of lading. So whom is the contract? The default rule is the carrier has a contract with the shipper. I did earlier talk about the signature clause. You would try to find, you know, that, that the party who's signing the bill of lading, you would try to look at the logo and try to ascertain who's the carrier. While the BL can be endorsed to a third party, you know, the shipper takes the BL, he's, he's negotiating the BL, he sells it to someone else. The shipper remains liable for issues related to the cargo, irrespective that they may have no title. They could not claim for the cargo, but it does not bar the shipping line or the carrier to pursue the shipper. With respect to the endorsee, he only becomes liable when he comes forth for delivery or makes a claim. And this is basis COXA 1992, the UK COXA Act 1992, or the Singapore COXA Act. I'm aware uh, India is still following the Bills of Leading Act 1855. So the provisions are a bit different. But if you look at international Bills of Leading, if they provide for English law or, or Singapore law, then the provisions of COXA 1992 comes. So the endorsee, even if the buyer has paid, if it does not come for delivery, uh, the carrier does not have a right to pursue unless he was the original party to the contract. That does not bar the carrier from going after the shipper. I, I know that many a times the shipper says, I have paid, I have transferred the BL, I'm no longer responsible. That is not the fact. The shipper remains liable, responsible all along till, for, till the fulfillment of the contract. What happens, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, there is actually an interesting case, the North Trader, which was ruled in, 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 in recently the English High Courts. Uh, the shipper was not aware that uh, that he was noted in the bill of leading a shipper. There was an agent who used to always put the, the person, a company's name as a shipper. And the shipment used to go from UK to, to Holland. Uh, it was basically a waste from a, a, what would you say, power plant for disposal. And there was a fire. The ship owners went after the shipper because under the you know, bill of leading contract, the shipper is a party to the contract. The shippers were able to defend or deny the claim saying that they were not aware they were the shipper and they are not the original parties to the contract. And the reason why I touched on it many a times if you're doing freight forwarding or if you're a, a liner operator, you would deal with freight forwarders who would actually be giving instructions on behalf of their clients. You would not know who's actual shipper. So you may wish to actually join the freight forwarder who has taken instructions unless until you are clear that the shipper who's named in the bill of reading is actually the shipper. 
otherwise you know it's quite possible uh, they may be able to move out what about bills of lading invariably you will find that uh, you know you uh, issue three original bills of lading uh, uh, all the original bills of lading are of the same value uh, i have seen some original bills of lading being issued as number 1 number 2 and number 3 it doesn't make a difference all are of the same value uh there is an attestation clause in the bills of lading one being accomplished the others being null, null and void which simply means that if one the first one is the is, is when it's done the carrier you know the, the, the contract of carriage is uh, accomplished uh, the other two bills of lading do not have any value as far as delivery is concerned what about straight bills of lading uh there have been conflicting uh, uh, what do you say uh, 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 judgments especially coming from us because they have a different act which is known as the pomeranian act but in so far as other jurisdictions are concerned uh, let's say singapore uh, uk and i assume that india should also have the same provisions uh, in the basis that you know there is being there the bl having an attestation clause it means that you need to surrender bl for delivery and and and, and that is it. so even if it's a straight bl even you to even though you know who is the consignee you still need to to deliver the the original bills of lading to take delivery i have listed out two cases apl and waspier which is a singapore court of appeal case and also the rafelas uh, which is a, a uk uh, court of appeal case which we touches of this point switch bills of lading are basically a commercial practice um, the only things which you could actually uh, uh, change in a switch bill of lading in my opinion is the shipper the consignee and notify party i am aware that some jurisdictions are not comfortable with switch bills because there may be transfer pricing issue there may be other pricing issues but in jurisdictions which allow or facilitate trade uh, there are no issues with the issue of switch bills of lading the reason why a switch bill of lading is issued is you know the original shipper does not want Uh, the trader to know who's a you know the trader does not want who's the original shipper and uh, the trader does not want the consignee to know who's a, the shipper otherwise they can cut the loop so to say uh, but take note one thing that you know if once you once the first set of bills of lading is exchanged for a switch bill of lading the original shipper is off the hook it is considered as a novation of a contract and then there's a new contract which brings up with the switch bill shipper so to say and and, and the consignee the obvious problem is you know if the switched bill if you are not happy with the background or if you if you are if you are if you are not happy with it you you know the loi he gives you may wish to ensure that you have some sort of a security from the shipper otherwise you would not be able to pursue the shipper and that was the case in 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 an australian case which was recently heard bologong coal and pcl shipping letter of indemnity again a very common practice cargo reaches the destination before the bills of lading uh, reaches so what happens is you know uh, that that being the case because uh, uh, bills of lading the consignee would request the carrier can he deliver the cargo to avoid those costs which accrue if there is a delay in taking delivery uh, so they would generally provide a letter of indemnity it's a commercial decision the carrier has a common law duty to release the cargo to whoever has the original bills of lading and if he releases the cargo to someone else he is liable for the full value of cargo so by taking a letter of indemnity what the carrier does is if should there be a competing claim by a third party he says yes i am liable and he tries to enforce the letter of indemnity which is given by the the party who's taken delivery so the worth of this letter of indemnity rests with 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 the value of the person doing it so if you are not comfortable you need to take a bank guarantee because a bank guarantee is a better risk than taking a letter of indemnity uh, this is purely a commercial risk no liability insurance uh, insurer will cover for this aspect so one should be very comfortable prior to releasing cargo on a letter of indemnity the last topic which i want to talk is the electronic bills of lading uh, i know that you know uh, electronic bills of lading is not something new it has been there for more than 20 years bolero has been there es docs came into prominence somewhere about what 7 10 years you have got e title and subsequently you have got these blockchains which are there like freight lens wave uh, cargo x etc there may be more platforms which are there there are new developments um, um, you know uh, i'm happy that they are there but 
what I see from my, my perspective, and I've written on this, is one, there is an issue of buy-in because there are still some jurisdictions which have issues on, they still require paper documents, that is one. Number two is, you know, if you have, if you go on one platform, you may not have an interoperator, it cannot be interoperated between these platforms. Although these platforms are working together, it will take some time. So as of now, you have an issue, you have different blockchains or different uh, platforms for, for, for electronic bills of lading. You may choose only one of them, but you know, you may, if you want to go to another platform, you have any, have an issue. Uh, I think as far as a carrier is concerned, the cost to migrate to this is not much because most of it is paid by the trade partners. But I think in the near future, you would see development. Having said that, what I have read, it would probably take a few decades, probably 10 or 20 years for everyone to have the same standard. But till then, you know, this will, this is something which you need to look for and see, you know, how it develops. So to summarize what I've spoken of, basically the bills of lading does three functions. Uh, it acts as a carrier's, uh, uh, you know, uh, standard trading conditions because of what is provided with the Hague or AGSP rules. It is key to the goods important in the trade transaction. Uh, I have reviewed the various clauses and, you know, I, I think I, I, I've done what I have to speak and I, I thank you for the patience for hearing me out. Uh, over to you, Amit. Jagan, thank you so much uh, for your detailed presentation on bill of lading. It was really insightful. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I now uh, request uh, Shantanu uh, Barkamkar Sahib to, you know, uh, give his, uh, you know, insight on the bill of lading before we move to the question and answers. Shantanu Sahib, over to you, please. Thanks, Jagan. And uh, fellow participant, Jagan is not new to Amtoy. He has visited our office for a meeting and followed by a seminar. He has contributed two articles to Amtoy News. We have been co-panelists, so thanks Jagan for insightful presentation. I think you are, uh, you have covered some very important legal issues, particularly the issues which may lead to claims or disputes. I think some of our colleagues have some questions about the operational issues also and the branding issue equally. The concept of house BL is tolerable so long as there is nothing such as master bill of lending. Because I have the original contract of carriage with the customer. If at all there is any master, I sh my bill of lading should be master because that's the original transport document. Whereas due to intentional mischief, and I, I saw while you were explaining and presenting, some educational website or teaching website still calls a bill of lading issued by shipping line is a master bill of lading. And issued by forwarder is a house bill of lading. And uh, they are giving education guidance. I can send you those links also. So this is one issue I want to deal with. Second operational issue is there are letters of credit which specify forwarder's bill of lading not accepted. My understanding is Shipping line owning some vessel somewhere, anywhere in the world, and whether they own or lease, they operating on a feeder vessel from India to somewhere, and then maybe the, vessel, the voyage terminates there of the container or it goes elsewhere. That particular bill of lading gets accepted, whereas a bill of lading issued by a multimodal transport operator, of course, eventually they agree, doesn't get accepted. In some cases, there is a condition, marine bill of lading, uh, you require a marine bill of lading. So, do you come across such uh, instances in Singapore or have you heard about it elsewhere in the world? Because these are very common difficulties our members report for prevention of our own bill of lading. Uh, 
thank you for the question. I, I think in my early part of my career, uh, there was an you know, uh, issue where, where one of the banks did say that we will not accept your BL, which is a house bill of lading. Uh, you know, this is on a closed loop. I will not tell the name of the bank. I will not tell the name of the carrier. Uh, we had written, I had written at that point of time, I was working for that carrier and I had written uh, to, the, to the, the bank authority, so to say, saying that we are being, uh, you know, uh, sick, you know we, we are being discriminated, so to say. Uh, a bill of lading, which has been signed as a carrier, it's a carrier's bills of lading. It is no longer a forwarder bills of lading. Uh, that is the reason why you have a fiat bill of lading, which says they want to try and circumvent it. We are no longer acting as a forwarder. A forwarder bill of lading, by definition, is only as agents. So I think if you face these problems, I think you need to go to your regulatory authorities. Uh, there would be an anti-competitive uh, com competitive commission because it is unfair for someone to say, uh, you know, to say that your bills of lading are not as, as, as valid as others. And you have rightly pointed out that in so far as a, a line operator is concerned, they might be also doing on the same basis what an MVOCC does, uh, or, or even a freight forwarder who has his own containers, yes? in the sense that he's load, loading on common carrier feeders. But even if you take it a bit forward, uh, the, the liner operators, they do not own the vessels in their own names. Generally, they own it on a single ship or a different ship. So basically, they have a separate entity which is doing the container operations and, and they issue a bill of lading in a different thing. So all of them are basically NVOCC. Uh, so, so there is no difference. So I think if you face this issue, I think you need to, 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 to try and get it sorted out. Because I think it would try to put one party at a bit of a, a disadvantage, so to say. Thank you. I think the reasons are definitely commercial and somehow some lawyers also had misguided and they continue to do that, the authorities, saying that multimodal transport document is a document as determined in ICJ UNTA uh, convention, UN UNTA convention. So, uh, we had to had a big battle to show Fiat BL is a BL. We gave copy of books published by Fiat on multimodal BL. We showed that even uh, Baltic Exchange, the Binko calls it multimodal transport BL. So just because the convention calls it a document, we were prevented from calling it a bill of lading. And for clarity to all the participants, a bill of lading can be also truck. It has to be laden on anything. It doesn't have to be shipped in fact. And we showed American references about what can be a bill of lading. It doesn't have to be shipped. Ship has no reference on being laden somewhere. So all these explanations we have given and uh, it is essentially now you have given one more idea. I think next time we come across, we will take it to competition commission or at least uh, convey because every time banks get disturbed and there are stakeholders who have never liked me issuing bill of lading. That's why we were one of the last countries, even Sri Lanka was issuing bill of lading before us. With this, let me also come to another issue. And uh, there is a question also posed by one of our uh, senior uh, member, which is Hemant Bhatia. And I want to add to his question. It is about rebooking cargo on so-called shipping line, or it can be MVOCC also for that fact. Means issue doesn't change. There are two scenarios. Number one, I'm just a booking agent as a freight forwarder. I am not issuing a transport document. The actual shipper is a shipper in the bill of lading. And then the consignee doesn't take the delivery. To what extent? You have touched this issue, but still it's a very serious issue. So we want to bring it out. Actual consignee uh, doesn't take the delivery. And then the detention accrues. And there are huge claims. Second scenario is a... Uh, I wouldn't use a term which you didn't like back-to-back -back bill of lading because it is never back-to-back, -back, I agree. But there is a uh, bill of lading as a vendor coming from a shipping line or NBOCC against a multimodal transport bill of lading or any forwarder's bill of lading or house bill of lading. In such cases, I will be the shipper in that bill of lading. I am using 
that shipping lines or MOCC container for booking and we get a claim. Now we know of some cases where British courts have held, and I think there is a similar case in Singapore. You will be able to explain it better. Where two good decisions have been given. Number one, the bill of lading clauses refers to merchant. And the courts have held it is with knowledge shipping line has accepted forwarder's name as shipper. Forwarder clearly knows that I don't have an ownership interest of the cargo and that we have a contractual rate or uh, there is no deception that that has been followed in us being shipper on the bill of lading. So that is one part. And, the, and so they have given full immunity to the forwarder and second case is they have limited the amount of detention that can be recovered to the cost of the container and not beyond that and these were shipments from Bangladesh to UK which had suffered huge detention. Now this is a bigger area that's coming out in dispute than damage or uh, uh, not not damage, damage to the goods or deterioration of the goods. Will you some, throw some light on this? Okay, I, I think, you know, uh, I have actually dealing with many of these type of claims from my clients and I think I'll set out my position and there are case laws. I don't recollect the names, but if anyone, if you would like the names, I would be happy to supply it. I actually written on this, uh, the case which you said, the UK case, I think MSC versus Cortinex, that's, that's the name yeah. of the case. Yeah. Uh, the, the question, the first question you said is, let's say a forwarder does a booking and he actually issues the carrier's bills of lading. He's only a booking party. He does not you know, take his bill of lading and the consignee does not take delivery. The question is, at the time of booking or prior to booking, did the carrier, you know, incorporate any terms? Uh, see, if you look at the bills of lading, it says the merchant, the definition of merchant is white, but the bill of lading is afterwards. So the question you need to look is whether there is any STC in the booking a confirmation which has been sent. In Singapore, what parties would do, a forwarder would generally contract on the basis, the NUOCC would generally contract on the basis of SLA terms, which just provide that the booking party is jointly and severally liable for the booking. So in India, I'm aware that it is not so sophisticated. So you may be able to work out that you knew that I was uh, only a forwarder and I am not, I, I'm not jointly and severally liable. I did not agree. But if there are any terms trying to incorporate this thing, my view is you would be able to go after forwarder. From the carrier's position, I think I'm taking a neutral position because I straddle both sides. He does not have any direct contact with the actual shipper. So the background search is actually being done by the forwarder. So if the if he if so basically he feels listen, I only have a contract with you. I only, you know, yes, you are given the bill of lading. But before they show the bill of lading, you know, I was dealing through you and you should have done your bit and it's not been clear. Now, so in fact, many a times for my clients have been able to recover the detention and demerage accrued at the destination from the forwarder because the shipper may run away, the consignee may run away. The consignee does not come forth to take delivery under COPSA 1992. There's no liability unless he comes to take delivery. Uh, there is only one thing which you have to look at, Article 3.6. I might be wrong on the article number, specific on the Hague-Bisbee rules. It says that the shipper cannot be held liable if there is no fault. So there has been a, I would say, a judgment which has been unreported in the Singapore courts, which touched on this. I don't quite well agree with the judgment, uh, to be fair, because only uh, uh, the, the lower court decision. In that case, the shipper was able uh, to try and deny because there was no fault on the shipper. Now, moving on to MSC Cortenax, basically what happened is uh, the shipment reached, I think, Bangladesh, uh, uh, I think it reached whichever place, and, and MSC wanted to pursue uh, demerage and detention. Uh, the court actually allowed detention, but they said that at some point of time, the contract becomes frustrated. You cannot have detention continuously, you know, once you know that, that there is no commercial value of the contract. So once you as a forwarder or, or if you are involved, what you need to do is to try and put the carrier on notice. You can't continue to expect detention all throughout. Once you know that the value of cargo is much lesser than the detention. And you should try and put the clock to try and cut the clock of saying that, listen, no more demerage. You need to prove your loss, so to say. If you are trying to prove your loss, it will be your container charges or your lease charges or rental charges and the costs which are incurred. So MSC and Cortinex has given you some ambit to say that you need to be proactive. 
if there is a claim, instead of sitting and watching, you need to take a front step and tell, listen, uh, the shipper is not taking, the consignee is not taking, carrier, you, you need to consider this as contract is frustrated, at least to try and tell him that your detention is not going to work and try to limit it. If the, the, the forwarder has got good liability insurance, uh, their policy would trigger for this. So I think uh, it's also important that the, the, the forwarder has a proper liability insurance to take care of the risk. I hope I've answered your question on this. No, thanks. In fact, uh, uh, you have again put me on guard because uh, I was a little relaxed on the issue that probably we have a better case against uh, the shipping lines for these liabilities. And maybe now we will be more careful while entering into contract with the shipping lines and with the exporter as well. Uh, there is another issue which I think you touched upon is about arbitration proceedings. To my understanding and when I discuss with lawyers, not just in maritime sector, all sectors, arbitration in India is not very popular. And if I may say, not very successful method of dispute resolution. On the other hand, now we have started a forum within Amtoy and with seven other associations like Amtoy as a conciliation forum. So it is seven association leaders come together and facilitate conciliation between two parties. And conciliation by Indian law and most countries, if two parties reach a conciliation and agree to something, in fact, then it can't be subject to litigation also because both parties are deemed to have reached an understanding. So there is a representation which we are making to government to make a self-regulating organization. And conciliation will be an integral part of the self-regulating organization on two tiers. One is among the logistics service provider stakeholder and second is exporter and importer, cheaper customer. So maybe you can give a thought to this and if you have some ideas on it, we will also share with our authorities for inclusion in that. But arbitration, unfortunately, suggested by you is not too popular in our judicial system. Uh, Amit, are there any other questions? Uh, like I asked Heman Bhatia's question, but if there are any other questions, you can ask them. Otherwise, I have many questions for Jagan. You can ask. Oh, sir, there are questions from the attendees. Uh, uh, Ms. Uma Murli has asked a question, which uh, I would read out. Uh, Uma is from Athena Global. One of her shipments... Uh, did with a carrier for Colombo due to lockdown customer not able to release the release but LC bank need original BL due to this damage has incurred customer is claiming on us that is the forwarder please advise how this can be tackled that's what her question is I think the first question you have to look at is is there any fault of the forwarder if there is no fault of the forwarder, you cannot claim against the forwarder. You need to have some sort of a negligence or some contractual provision to do it. Invariably, what happens, the shipper will say, I only dealt with you, but you need to, to look at it carefully. Listen, there has been a, a, a situation which is out of control. And, and therefore, you know, I, 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 it's something which is out of my, my context on this. So I... On the basis of facts which are given, I think you know the forwarder should just deny the claim. You need to say what is a you know, mistake. If the forwarder has not been able to provide the bills of lading, yes, because you know he has not been able to transport, that would be a different issue. Then you would probably look at you know you could probably say, listen, I want to give it to you, but if, you know you can't. You're off. Your your your. If the client is in a place where you can't travel. force major because force major in my view there has to be a provision in the contract i am aware that the indian contract act has a provision of force uh, for force major but i think uh, at least in common law jurisdiction it's very difficult to look at force major okay. i think let me supplement on this 
you are right we had many lawyers speak on force major and frustration of contract and they said indian courts are very conservative on force major means uh, just to give a exaggerated case if i can't move cargo even if i had to air freight the whole cargo for moving it the courts would say okay it's a commercial consideration uh, why it couldn't go by ocean you had to air freight it so the considerations of courts are different and very conservative but frustration of contract is lot easier but there is a fault of the forwarder over here and people give 60 days 90 days 120 days credit so huge <laughs> amount against previous consignment is outstanding so there is a fault of the forwarder and that is why arm twisting is possible now if you have a solution for this i think people will uh, build a temple for you for giving a solution to people. <laughs> i have no solution for the credit part to be very frank uh, it's something which which is being done for business reasons uh, the other way is, is to try and you know at least in other countries what they do is they probably go and take insurance on this uh, the credit risk so that if they are not paid then the insurer can go after that but barring that i don't have any solutions on that So for that fact, uh, multimodal transport act gives us lien over cargo for recovery of goods. It's difficult to implement, but a legal right of lien is available with us. Amit, any next question? Thank you, uh, Mr. Hector Patel wants to know uh, about digital BL, which shipper can print on normal A4 paper, and how does Stamp Act affect? it if at all it affects uh, i'm not sure whether this is something to do with our bill of lading you know uh, laws and rules but his uh, question is more about the stamp act which uh, i i will not touch on the stamp but, act because i am not aware i know there is a stamp act in india i i i am not a lawyer i don't practice in india but i know there is a stamp act so i will leave that aside because it is outside my uh, what do you say knowledge as this thing But in so far as 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 far printing of bills of lading is concerned, I would not say it's a digital bill because it is being printed on paper. It is only the place of printing is different. Uh, invariably, some carriers are giving their own stationery, allowing the carrier to uh, sorry the shipper to print, or they are allowing a, a PDF form to be printed. So I don't see it as a digital bill at all. It is the place of printing is different. I would leave it to Mr. Shantanu to talk about uh, you know uh, the stamp act if he is aware. i think you stole my words and this is another mischief that is going on it is just change of place of printing and it is being projected as a digital bill of lading when it is not a electronic bill of lading digital means digital is one step ahead i would say more than it just uh, i would say a image file that's been sent to you for printing over there and for airway bill this has been a practice for long time and essentially i don't know which stamp act uh, he is referring to uh, if it is for import delivery order it makes no difference where you print because it's the location of cargo for bill of lading which stamp act is applicable at least i am not aware maybe if he sends detail we will definitely study if somebody has a stamp duty issue with printing of bl it is a new issue to me and let's see Amit, have you faced such an issue? Because now it's very normal to print bills of lading. Yeah, sir. So, uh, the issues, I think, from the uh, side of the bank, you know, when there is an LC involved and uh, it has to be negotiated in the bank, banks are the one who, you know, insist that there should be a revenue stamp on the. That's the only, you know, thing that I uh, have experienced, you know. But when uh, we uh, give bill of ladings to shippers where there is no bank involved, they are happily accepting it, and you know. there is no issue but i am also not fully aware of the reason and what the stamp act says you know and why the stamp is needed i think one big problem we face with banks is the employees serve bank for two years three years and they are gone and just because they sit in important position carry a important label they become stubborn about lot of issues and they don't give explanation why a stamp is required maybe i mean 
we should write to banks where you have faced this problem they have to give us legitimate reasons and if not we have to complain to reserve bank about their high indebtedness and i know what you are saying they become stubborn and customer gets angry with us so and customer is not concerned with all these things he just want something they are also we are on the wrong side of the stick maybe no. i think we can come to the next question yes uh mr manish has said uh, his question is is electronic bill acceptable as per hague with the rules and no blockchain uh, blockchain technology companies are considering payment on stamp duty it's a similar question i feel i i think you know uh, he has got a valid point because if you look at the hague and hague with the rules you need to issue a document of title document by definition is is a paper document even by coxa 1992 uh, again you all don't have coxa 1992 you have the bills of dating act but coxa 1992 while the secretary of state has provisions to for electronic documents it has not been done either in the uk or singapore but the way they do it in electronic bills of dating is they they put themselves in a platform that there is some sort of a user agreement which they agree that they'll be bound by so you know it is it is a close circle so to say except i think for e title it's on a peer to peer basis so they agree that they will be bound by it and therefore they say that we will accept it and if a party does want a paper document it is very easy for him to to surrender the ebl electronic bill to to carrier and say i want a paper document i don't think i see any issues on this and as far as the stamp act is concerned i leave it because it's not in <laughs> my 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 knowledge so that's something which uh, I, i am not answer on that does that Thank you. answer your question we will move to the next question uh, mr sharat patak what is uh, his question is what is the liability if the shipped on board bl is issued without actually container being on board okay uh, i think it's a very good question in the sense that you know uh, if let's take a case when you are buying some commodities some contracts on commodities and you jelly say that i will accept a shipment which is on so and so date on the 31st of december and if you issue a bill of lading saying it is 31st and the container has not been stuffed so there is a fraud which has been done so to say as fraud is a pretty strong word but if the bill of lading had said let's say it's the 31st december it showed 1st or 2nd of january 2020 it would not be in conformity with the sale contract and the consignee or the bank would have rejected the documents correct so if the cargo market crashes down the consignee would have a would say listen i would not have accepted i would not have suffered the loss i would have been entitled to reject it he could claim for the total loss so i think while you will say listen there is doesn't make a difference it has to do more with the sale contracts so if the sale contract does provide for some specific dates and other ways if you look at lme stock exchanges you know lme has got stock exchanges where they put the metals sometimes the payment of 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 the, the the metals is done on the basis of the ship on board date so sometimes the shipper will ask oh can you give me a earlier date or later date because that is the day the trading margin has gone up yes so there is again an issue of fraud we as a carrier your 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 your, your member as a carrier might not be aware but you has a duty is a third party to actually show what is correct so if a third party gets a container you know a bill of lading which doesn't do he is uh, you know he could attack for the full value of the cargo if not at least for the loss yes sir okay and will it constitute breach of trust it would but then the question is you know uh, the, even if it constitutes it what are the damages you are going to pay i am i'm hitting directly the damages you know what is the worst case scenario we are looking at the contractual provisions we are not looking at the the, the criminal provisions they are separate you know they might say is a white collar crime but like i said as far as, as as payment of this is concerned from a contractual provision you look at only at damages okay thank you i think uh, vasant has uh, has uh, received some questions by email which uh, you know vasant would like to ask on behalf of uh, some of our members vasant please yeah um, jagan uh, these are the same questions which uh, i think i had mailed you yesterday so some of them were had come from uh, mr venkat uh one of them is the requirement of shipper to add cargo value on the bl to fulfill lc requirement 
according to the customer some lines are giving some are you uh, some are objecting to it so what is the okay uh, the reason why you should not put the cargo value on the bill of lading is because as soon as you put in the cargo value it becomes an ad valorem bn uh, the carrier you know is not liable for the full value of the cargo we talked about the hague and hague wisby rules or we talked there's a limitation of liability which is there but once you put that value in the bill of lading you know if the carrier is responsible for the full value of the cargo the problem with this is when the carrier takes liability insurance there is a precondition that the carrier contracts on the basis of liabilities as has been provided either the hague or hague wisby rules if it is anything more than this the 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 the, the insurance provider is entitled to exclude or say that my liability is only to this limit you need to look at the policy wordings so it's a practical issue i think you may have an lc the reason why they have an lc is because the consignee might wish to cut down the cost of cargo insurance there are two ways to sort this out you know many of my clients have asked one is you could go to your a carrier could go to his insurance provider and say can you also cover me for the full value and the, the the insurance provider would ask for a, a premium for this the problem is if it is only for some few shipments it is uneconomical your premium your, your premium which you will charge will be much more yes so it would actually be better for the shipper to go directly to cargo insurers and take this this insurance yes the other way is the carrier may wish to take cargo insurance for the full value as a joint assured that's one of the ways but i am not you know i think we should be aware that a carrier never tries to do on a full value because the exposure is huge so that is the reason why you should not put the full value i think that that should answer your question thank you uh so one of the questions on the q and a mr harish lalwaniya that you stated that uh you stated that the shipper is responsible for all cost unless the contract is completed does that mean in case of long standing containers not cleared at destination one can claim the cost from the shipper yes why not that is the same thing which mr shantanu and i were discussing yeah. let's say the shipper has misdeclared the cargo many a times i see it actually what happens is people misdeclare the cargo and the consignee would not come forth for delivery so so my point is is there a fault of the shipper yes there is a fault of the shipper so and, and the shipper cannot say oh i you know i have sold the contract the document has gone if we look at the the bills of lading act or the hague wisby rules it allows because the, the the original contracting party is a shipper and, and, and the carrier okay so you could do but only defense which you have talked is no fault of the no fault of the cargo interest frustration of the contract so these are things which which uh, the cargo interest can look at or the the forwarder could look at does that answer your question okay i think uh, it should be okay uh is it mandatory to take an loi before issuing a switch bl are there any standards or formats or what is it i jagan let me add little twist to question why you answer this see switch bl often the shipper or consignee requires to change the port pair means if it was uh, say mumbai to hamburg and uh, switching is done here which is the legal switching what you explained people may say that okay no you show shipment from bangladesh or show shipment from dubai while no transportation has taken place the port pair on the bill of lading changes so you can answer it together i think if you are not stating the actual port of loading port of discharge and the date where the shipment has been effected i think it is fraud i actually written on this and i think uh, one of the papers has cited me on this it's akin to fraud i stand by it and the reason why people do it is there might be some trade agreements between these countries where they get lesser taxation uh, you know there people try to benefit out of it a carrier should be clear on that aspect so no i would not recommend that by doing that the carrier is open to to charges uh, you know for for claims by the government it, it might be blacklisted also in so far as a letter of indemnity is concerned there is no industry standard letter of indemnity perhaps uh, you know it's something which you can look at 
Uh, invariably, parties look at uh, what do you say the IGP and I club wordings, uh, the release of cargo without BL. There is an IG. If you if you do a Google search, you'll find. You will amend it to try and do it. The reason why you take a LOI is to protect if something goes wrong, and that is the reason why you take an LOI. It all depends on who the counterparty is, who's signing it. What I notice is many a times you take LOI without not understanding why you take and who's signing it. That's more important than the LOI itself. Very true. Uh, Wasn't any more switch? There are actually there are several questions, but I'm just selecting which are uncommon types. So uh, again, coming back to the switch bill of lading, is it a common transaction for trading while it is an acceptable norm. Switch so is switch BL a legal? Is switch BL is a legal from a insurance perspective? And what precautions should be taken while releasing a switch BL? Okay, some countries do not like switch. I'll tell you why. And I'm, I'm talking from a very general view. Uh, a, a party might open a subsidiary company, let's say, or open a third party com you know, company in Singapore or Hong Kong or Dubai, and he may sell and do something on his transfer pricing. Yes. So you might say, listen, he's trying to keep all his profits in an outside place, whereas you're actually doing a thing. So that is a legality some countries might not like. But the fact is, you know, trading centers do provide funding. They provide services. If you look at rice shipments, which go from Yangon or Vietnam to Africa, if you look at so many shipments which are there, there has to be some facilitation. And that's why uh, centers of economic centers like Singapore, Hong Kong and Dubai do facilitate by, by giving funding, by giving some value addition, just not to you know, resale of, of cargo. And obviously they do not want uh, the actual shipper to know who's actual consignee. Uh, or you know, in the internet world, you can find everything, but they want to make it difficult as far as possible. So I don't see any illegality part in these centers, but in some countries they may raise issue. Your customs might say you're trying to, to con us by charging more to do it, but that's a different issue. But if you look at it, insurance part, I have not seen anyone raising this issue because it is not illegal. Uh, and so far as the buyer is buying, if the switch BL only changes the name of the, the shipper, the port of loading is still the same. There is no fraud being undertaken. So it should be okay. That's my view. And secondly, insurance policy normally is endorsable. Like bill of lading is endorsable, insurance policy is endorsable. Uh, there are several questions, but one of them is uh, the BLs. Now, most of the places where the BLs are to order or consigned uh, in absence of bank mention, and there is no endorsement on the BL, is it legal to release, accept that BL? And what is the liability or how does it go? If you look at COXA 1992, it clearly says to the lawful holder of the bill of lading. The definition, if, if a person, if the bill, is, bill of lading is not endorsed, right? Arguably, it is the person who's having it is not the lawful holder. So if you, if the first one is not accomplished, the second or third BL could come for delivery. Okay. So if you want to protect, I, I'm, again, I, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm giving you a commercial advice. If you want to do this, ask for all original bills of lading, okay. if you want to do it. Otherwise, I think it is always better to ensure that the bills of lading are well endorsed. Is there a liability differential when one surrenders a bill of lading and one releases a CV BL? Okay, that's a pretty interesting <laughs> question. I'll tell you why. You know, if you look at a CV bill of lading, under the Hague or Hague-Visby rules, it does not fall within the documents. It, it requires a document of title. A CV bill of lading, by definition, is not a document of title. Yes. Whereas a, a straight bill of lading is a document of title, even though only one person has to submit it for delivery. So arguably on that basis, you could argue that the hague Bisbee rules does not apply for CVA bills. Having said that, even in CVA bills of lading, you would find a clause per among clause, which would provide for the hague Bisbee rules there. In actual effect, there is no difference. But there are very subtle differences where you could argue that the, the CVA bill is out of the provisions of the Hague or hague Bisbee rules. Okay. Again, coming to the misdeclarations of the cargo, what happens if a shipper misdeclares mis a dangerous cargo on the bill of lading? 
who is liable in case of claim? That's an interesting question, you know. I mean, it happens in India that a lot of shippers... So very frequently, I am just selecting, picking up questions which are very frequently people are facing. So. I have faced many claims on this type. If there is a misdeclaration of cargo, what, what happens is, you know, people want to save that DG, declare, DG extra DG charges. Correct. The problem is if the cargo is stored next to the boilers, it, you might have Deepavali. Uh, I can talk to you about Hanjin, Pennsylvania. All these vessels where firecrackers were stored uh, near the boilers and due to heat, they started burning and the ship can get burned. The point is a shipper who is doing it is going to run away. He's going to be a smart tech. He will never be able to find you. The forwarder who has given this declaration would be in suit. Uh, if he has liability insurance, his liability insurance will deal with the claim provided the forwarder has taken proper precautions. He has done his due diligence, which is there. The second thing is when you have a catastrophic you know, incident like burning of a ship, easily the total exposure will be hundreds of millions, or if not tens or twenties of millions. So this, uh, your, your limits will also not be of assistance. So the moral of the story is you should know your counterparty, your cargo claimant is not a fly by night. You should know what he is doing because something goes wrong. The other party will look at, uh, you know, he will try to do a shotgun approach, try to pursue whomever he could because the declaration has been made by the forwarder, not by the shipper. So he's dealing with the forwarder for the, for the, for the shipment. I, I would like to add here in, uh, sorry. Um, Not to complete, uh, I have a separate question, but very alerting one. So yeah. to complete this. Uh, my experience, I would like to share about this misdeclaration, you know, by a shipper. Uh, you know, it's a has cargo, but he has not declared the class or maybe, you know, not declared it is has. Uh, what I have, uh, you know, experienced is uh, the forwarders, you know, in India, particularly, they do a lot of, you know, uh, unwanted uh, extra job for the shipper by signing the MSDS and the packing sheet and all that. And that's where they get, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, into a soup, basically, because if these declarations are uh, origin, originally signed by the shipper and attested by the authorized signatory of the shipper, then I think uh, there is a good case that the forwarders, uh, you know, will be protected by his insurance, you know, or whatsoever. But, but the general practice over here is, you know, we all get swayed by the customer and we do a lot of extracurricular activity, as I called it, you know, which is not uh, uh, in under our purview. But that, that's what, you know, the forwarders should be aware of. That's what I would like to add. So, Amit, you are being polite. I think these are suicidal tendencies. This is living with death wish. And I have Jagan explained the liability will be much beyond your liability insurance cover of one million dollars or two million dollars. It yeah. will run into hundreds of millions of dollars, and that two hundreds of millions of dollars, if you are lucky, if there is some uh, life at stake, it will be even more with criminal liabilities. Then if the ship is in port and there is a collateral damage, it will go beyond that. Whether you want to make people more alert about it? Yeah, I think, you know, the problem is invariably what happens is generally the shippers or the forwarders who do it. They are the small time ones. Uh, uh, so, so generally there is no money, they run away. But if you are a sizable company, you want to develop your name brand. If you are not someone, if you don't want to, you still want to be, everyone wants to be like, now I would like it to be there forever. I'm sure all of you are running your own companies would like the brand to grow. So you need to have some standards. And if you're doing it, I think the chances are, if you have this catastrophic issue, it will be difficult to survive. So that would be a shame. I think it is, you know, the amount of margins you would make, it doesn't make sense. So uh, the long and short is, I'm sure you will know who's, who's shipping DG cargo. If you know the DG shipping, I think you need to have a separate desk. You need to ensure that, you know, his hands are clean. Your hands don't get tainted. Uh, people do. There is, there has been an English case where in, uh, a forwarder in, in Holland had to pay about five, 10 million. Uh, so it was not, you know, he was able to do it, but you know, you need to see whether it is worth it. You might get a $50 margin or hundred dollar margin. It is not worth it. So that's the way I would look at it. I think there is one serious issue where I think people should be alert and I am sharing my own case so it's real life. Uh, we normally don't handle 
refrigerated perishable cargo for the risk that are involved in this case we handled it as a custom broker but we did the booking of the cargo and it is uh, safe from chennai to singapore and the cargo got damaged now we were under sweet impression is we are just a custom broker and we are uh, booking the cargo and the trucking is also by the shipper and uh, the nvocc said that cfs has made some mistake cfs refutes and the cargo temperature maintenance has not been proper i have not issued bill of lading in fact what i understood from the lawyer appointed by insurance company that they have filed a suit against me because i have not issued a bill of lading had i issued a bill of lading my liability could have been limited and they have refused to file suit on the nvocc's where they are actual shipper because by filing claim on us they feel they will have unlimited liability on us whereas if they pursue the case against nvocc they will have a quantified limited liability so can you one enlighten on the issue two what precautions we should take one is i will stop accepting such cargo but every time you can't because your own big customer sometimes has such shipments and as a policy we don't issue bill of lading for perishable cargo or now we may stop accepting it also and with knowledge the shipper has filed a suit on us that we will not have limitation of liability so any views on this yeah i think what happens is you know i would recommend that all parties including as a customs broker or as as a forwarder you should Uh, there is always an issue of before and after which you rightly point out it is before the shipment and or after the shipment you provide trucking services or you doing custom broker i think it is always best to incorporate standard trading conditions i believe india there is uh, i think uh, i forget the name but there is a standard trading condition uh, not provide a fishy of you know triple i triple FBI. standard yeah, trading conditions of yeah. triple fbi so i i would recommend that you know that should be you know as a matter of course everyone should say that you know we are trading on standard trading conditions and that should at least be the same liability provisions which are there in the bills of lading uh, that is what happens in 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 places like singapore singapore use sla stc uh, singapore logistics association in uk use bfa in 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 all other places you generally have this stcs india has a stc but i don't see it commonly used perhaps this is something which your association can consider that when you give your booking we contract on the basis of so and so you know uh, uh, stc which is incorporated a copy can be provided on request and that should be incorporating this this condition so to say and will be a protection to you all well our footer of the quotation does carry business accepted subject to triple fa standard trading conditions so not withstanding the footer they say We uh, in India there is no legal force for standard trading conditions. So they... Well, that, that that is you know again that is uh, you know your your if you look at your liability insurers you you have a duty to contract on terms. Your liability insurer is not going to cover for the full value. You have done your bit. Your law has to develop. If tomorrow if all forwarders are going to be for unlimited liability, the cost of doing business will also increase. It will be passed to your customer. I think uh, you know you have two sides of the coin. I think. if it goes to court i know the court process in india is very slow it will take at least 5 10 years so people will reconsider their position but i think if if it if it you know they would look at it i think it would it would be valid if it is properly incorporated that's my view see unfortunately indian courts have very little experience of maritime law so this is where we have a problem and i wish to add to what you have said and that's a question we face quite often the association of multimodal transport operator is about licensed multimodal transport operator so my liability regime is predefined in multimodal transport act of 1993 and now new version will come secondly my liability regime is also predefined on the back of the bill of lading by the terms i have laid down over there so when i am issuing my own multimodal transport bill of lading or you can call it document 
is there a case to have parallel standard trading condition one is law second is document so should i create a third document for liability regime by creating standard trading conditions i think the standard trade you know, there is always a before and let's let's take an example let's say your shipper tells you a shipment that i want to do from singapore to colombo and your booking uh, uh, clerk or booking officer uh, didn't hear colombo and she heard canada uh, ottawa whatever place and she does a shipment now i think what would happen is you would probably say there is no loss or damage to the cargo uh, you would probably look at from a different perspective it happened at that point of time so i think there are some gaps which is there uh, if you look at there is no there is no seamless transfer so to say it would always be best that till the time you if you are doing multimodal transport yes the mm the multimodal transport by goods act will apply but if you are not doing multimodal transport if you are doing unimodal or if you are doing only facilitation then you know i arguably multimodal transport you know should not apply that's my view because there is also one more act the coxa indian oh, coxa act 1925 which applies so there is a conflict there so 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 i think you know to ensure that there is some sort of a backup it would be best to also have an sla and say that you know we contract on this and the sla also provides that when you contract on multimodal multimodal act applies when you contract on dl the dl act so so that is already provided i think then we are going into a difficult domain isn't it like one we say that we deal with multimodal transport act and that is our prime coverage under the act and then we have a third document so we will be creating better clarity or more confusion about what applies because as far as the act is concerned it's clear the bill of lading conditions are clear then if we create another trading condition so i am not sure in such cases more is better than less or less is better than more i have a different view i, I hear you out on that but i think what happens is you know if you are issuing your bill of lading if you are doing a multimodal transport i think what you say is correct but what happens before what happens after is something which is not coming under the provisions so you can have a catch all contract or the stc which covers on that and i would probably look at all other jurisdictions which are doing the same thing if you look at before members also issue the bills of lading and the before members you know, uh, bills of lading terms are mentioned in, in this thing even sla they, 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 the 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 hbsb rules are provided so i don't see any issues to, to put it together so it all depends what is your role you are doing if the the loss happened during a multimodal transport that's okay that the multimodal transport goods act will will take into effect but i think uh, the difference in bifa and us is we are specifically in domain of multimodal transport and our law and our members are typically in that domain so we are opening another domain open for transaction with us bifa is a c everything and custom brokerage everything whereas we are in a limited domain okay uh there are several question but in general all are pertaining many of them are pertaining to an loi which normally here we have a practice of in india at least for any small changes of the bill of lading for anything an loi is asked for so letter of intent is taken from the client now everyone wants to know how much does the value does it have and how much does it safeguard from their interest or when it comes to any legal issues or how much does it see the loi is only valid to the person who is signing it if it is of some value if the company is a 1 dollar company you know and he would allow the company to go fold on he is not going to pay more than 1 dollar so so point is you know uh, you have need to look at why are you doing it what are the risks it's basically a commercial risk which you are taking suppose the goods have been declared as ba and then the customer wants it to be declared as b for whatever reasons for trading reasons or something so if you declare it as b you may have an exposure to the authorities because you know there might be issues of taxation there might be issues on custom duties there may be issues on fraud somewhere else so so the question is when you are doing this you would probably say oh i have an loi but when you want to enforce a loi it cannot enforce us against any penalties it can only enforce you against any contractual disputes yes now even if you go on the contractual disputes does is the person signing it does he have authority to sign is his company of worth 
who will at that point of time be willing to pay. Third thing is, even if you, you know, if you want to go, he will probably go and defend it, deny it in the Indian courts. You know, you all are based in India. So you would probably never see the light of the paper, so to say. So, so my, my view is the letter of indemnity is good if you have it from a counterparty who's sound and who will honor it. Uh, see, since there are so many questions, I have two more sub-questions on these issues. Number one, will this LOI in fact be construed as you being collaborator for that, be it contractual, be it legal or be it taxation? Since you become a conniving pie, you are in collaboration with collusion with them. That's one. Number two, are there real instances where letter of indemnity has real enforceability? Means assuming that party is sound, but still, does it have an enforceability? Well, it has. It certainly has enforceability. It is at least in the bulk rate. It is very common practice uh, that uh, cargo is released on the LOI of the charters, and if the owners are pursued by any other holders. They generally go after the charter. Uh, there is a, a recent case of Songa if, against an Indian party wherein the, the Indian uh, Kanzaini went bust. The only issue is that if the Kanzaini goes bust, then the charter or the owner may have no way to recourse. So that is the second part of your question. So if you have someone who is still there, so if you're not happy with the letter of indemnity, you should take a bank guarantee because then you can go and enforce it in the bank. That's a better risk than a LOI. The first part, conniving, is a very correct term. And I'd like to say that if you know that there is something wrong, then you're participating. And, uh, you know, you can't turn a blind eye. Lord Denning said blind eye knowledge. I'd probably say the same. You know that something is wrong and you're participating in it. You're also, you know, uh, uh, you should also be held liable for it. If it is a question of, you know, the quality of the cargo and there are genuine disputes for both parties, yes, then you can use LOI. But if you know that the cargo is actually damaged and you still give a clean bill of lading, that is a, a fraud. So that is where it stands. Anything else? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, one, yeah. okay, there are many people have faced this, like uh, this shipment, people take shipment, it is gone. And after reaching the destination, do some government authorities like DRI and all that for misdeclaration or some whatever reason, they have given instructions to hold the cargo, not to deliver, not to release it at the destination. Whereas there is a direct bill of lading or and there's a forwarder bill of lading involved. Likewise, always shipping line will only be the cargo is on hold. The shipping line is holding the forwarder responsible for it. So how does it, how do we get rid of such type of issues like, you know, where uh, cargo, okay, I, you know, the government gives the cargo on hold and, you know, okay. not to release the cargo. And after that, it's just lying without so that, that, I think, uh, you know, the, the issue is if there is a cargo on hold, I'd probably prefer that the cargo is shipped back to the load port and give okay. it to the government. Instead of getting it to a destination, uh, other other jurisdictions, other terminals, the cost of holding it would be very expensive. Uh, the term, the, the carrier would also perhaps ask for detention or demerge. One way of to circumvent it is if you cannot do reshipment back, is to devan the cargo, put it in a CFS. At least the cost will be lesser. Uh, so I have no answers to this, but the question what you would probably need to to talk to the you know if you're issuing your own bills of lading is to go to the shipper, go to the, the customs, but there has to be a solution that you cannot hold it indefinitely because there's cost to it. Customs department will not perhaps agree to pay any charges to you all. I saw one question whether received for shipment bill of lading is valid for negotiation. Yeah, I, will of I think the answer is quite simple. It depends on terms of the letter of credit. Even forwarders cargo receipt, forwarders warehousing receipt. See, if a buyer and seller is willing to exchange money on shaking of hand and a photograph of shake hand, it's a valid contract between two parties. So it really depends on the contractual condition. So 
there can't be a yes and no answer for this you have to see what buyer and seller has agreed and it is for the seller to check whether our document suits his requirement okay ah uh, i think most we covered most of the questions because a lot of questions are there but most of them are either they are repeat or something similar so was it i have one yeah. question which is Please. Uh, uh, you know, a little different than what we have discussed it's about Please, general average uh so mr jagan uh, the question is from mr vijay hatekar general average how liabilities are decided can you uh, give your input on this please? okay what happens is if there is i'll give you an example of a ship which is sailing and and it has got let's say four or five holes i'll take a bulk vessel and if there is fire on let's say hole number 1 uh and, and the fire starts spreading the master has some options one of the option is he floods hole number 2 it's a voluntary flooding of hole number 2 due to which you know it the fire does not spread so hole number 1 the fire you know and the damage to the hull would be considered particular average because it was fortuitous it happened by chance but hole number 2 the damage to hull and cargo it was voluntarily and it saved cargo in 3 4 5 and the hull so because it is a general average all these parties have to contribute to the expenditure or the losses which have been done so that is general average. because if you do not do this voluntarily expenditure or sacrifice the whole voyage or the whole adventure will be lost it comes outside marine insurance but your marine insurance policies do cover it it is more on the question of equity but if you look at the rotation law that's how it is developed and what would happen is you would look what is the value of property say what are the expenses incurred let's say there's a ship which is on fire the owners could do nothing because the value of hull nowadays is not so much a container vessel of let's say 2000 3000 tu in this depressed market will only be about 10 million the value of cargo might be in 100 million so to say if there is a fire and to spend this money to complete the void if the owner is going to spend more than 5 million or you know you know you know it says why should i spend it i have no intention because i know my vessel is of no this thing so it does it for the common benefit so that whichever cargo is saved yes they will contribute whichever property is saved including freight if it is at risk so the way you do it is there are there are a set of rules known as york and pope rules you have specialized people known as average adjusters i am also a senior associate of the association of average adjusters wherein you look at dispassionately look at both sides we we are we are, we are neutrals we look at what it is in we'll adjust it and we'll say okay this is what you need to pay in container vessel gas situations it will take a few years in a bulk vessel because the number of parties are much lesser it would take much lesser period okay does it answer your yes question? yes jagan you have answered the operative part but the basic background or the Uh, principal part of it i am not too satisfied because it has roots in traditions where the merchant and the carrier or the ship owner took an adventure today really am i asking the shipping line to enter into such a venture which is a adventure rather than normal commercial business because shipping lines have scheduled services so i am not asking them to that okay you take this risk i am sharing your risk and come into an adventure so is that dogma or still valid i i see where you are coming you know i i recall you had the same position when i was speaking on ga the last yeah, this day yeah. it is quite possible that you ask the carrier that you should take the ga risk and it is a question of increased cost i am actually for ga i'll tell you why it is not that i am supporting them in the moment of danger the father of the voyage the master it does what is for the common benefit if the ga was not there he might well say listen i have no interest in it so it's actually beneficial for third party because these are voluntary sacrifices you, if you remember if you look at you know a voyage once a voyage is frustrated the owners can say listen the voyage is frustrated you can tell the cargo interest to come and take delivery so if you if you look at from my perspective i think it is actually in the interest of cargo interest that there is g yes there is uh, what do you say a uh, 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 feeling among cargo interest that carriers are not doing something 
You can always deny GA and which people have done. There is a case CMA, CGM, I think I forget the name, Libra. I think CMA, CGM, Libra. 80% uh, of the cargo interest paid for the GA. I think 12% or 15% cargo interest denied it, defended it successfully on the basis that the owners did not exercise due diligence at the beginning of the voyage. The vessel was unseaworthy. So I think, you know, you need to look at it from that perspective. If you do not have GA, the consequences might be much more worse. Having said that, you know, it's been continuing for thousands of years. Uh, you have cargo insurance to take care. Cargo insurance is not very expensive. I think that's the way the allocation of risk takes place. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take two, three last questions. Uh, okay. Uh, does the forwarder book a booking done by a forwarder without his BL being involved, uh, the shipping line BL involved directly, does he become liable for non-release of cargo at destination by consign? I, I did answer this earlier. Yeah, if, I, the carrier, it, yeah. I, if the carrier does try to incorporate terms like SLA STC or BFA STC or right. even Malaysian you know, Trade Forwarder Association <laughs> STC, uh, what would happen is the forwarder is jointly and severally liable for the booking. So there would be a way to go after the forwarder. I have done that in Singapore, for that matter. Okay. Uh, uh, Vasant, I would like to add here uh, mm -hmm. that all the players today are explicitly mentioning in their delivery order, the DO which we get for the empty container, that the forwarder or the booking party is liable for detention and destination in case the consignee doesn't take delivery. And I, I've had such okay. cases and that's why, you know, I, I had to go through that pain. Thank you. Okay. But is so, there a legal so, enforceability of booking party? It Please. is. I think, you know, the point what I try to say is, you know, I, let's say from the carrier's point of view, from, from the shipper's point of view, the forwarder's point of view, would probably say, listen, I am only an agent and I have not done any fault. I agree with you. Uh, but the shipping line perhaps does not have a direct link with the shipper. So he is looking at you as a contractual party. He only comes to know the shipper when the bills of lading is issued. The other way is to say, I don't agree to your terms. Like what Amit was saying that, you know, I don't agree to your terms. I will only, you know, I'm only acting as an agent. The actual shipper is so-and-so. You can put in the booking itself. Uh, but I don't see that happening in, in the real trade. That's my view. I think... Uh, if you have incorporation of terms, it is the courts would generally give, you know, uh, a, you know, they'll say these parties have voluntarily accepted it. We should give effect to whatever they have accepted. It. No, but uh, I am not a multimodal transport operator. I am not issuing bill of lading. Shipping line doesn't give any brokerage to us. So the factual position is my job is as a custom broker to just uh, do the custom procedure. And as an incidental service, we do trucking. So I have no privity of contract with the shipping line, whereas shipping line issues a bill of lading. So they know who is the merchant and who is the shipper. I am merely picking up truck uh, cargo, means I am not even an agent. And well, I, I... the issue is even more complex. See, if the first right of recourse fails and then they come after forwarder is another matter. What Amit is saying is the first recourse is on forwarder because we are available. Well, I agree with you. I think, you know, the forwarders are generally much easier targets. They generally have liability insurance and generally, they, you know, you would be dealing with big forwarders, so they would probably look at it. You have got a point and the question is you need to look whether there is any incorporation of terms. Like Amit is saying, if there's incorporation of terms, you would probably say that you have been told this is the basis where you can take a booking. Now, insofar as, as, as contract is concerned, you would say that there's no consideration. I would argue for consideration on the basis there is some benefit detriment. Because once you're providing a service, you're getting a benefit. You're providing, you, you know, because the carrier released the container to you, you could actually provide a service to your client as a customs house agent or whatever it is and to earn a living. So benefit detriment, at least under English law, could be founded. You know, even though there might be no money payments, it's not so difficult. So on that basis, if there is a provision in the contract, I would argue that you would need to be cautious. But if you do not have, and if the, if the shipping line knows that as a course of dealing, you're always in issuing carrier's bills of leading, the shipping line's bills of leading, you're only acting as a facilitator, 
your best defense is to say, listen, I'm only a, an agent. The agent is not responsible for the faults of the principal. Direct him to your principal and let your principal sort it out. The problem why the carriers would like to go after forwarder is because the principles are something which they don't know. They are dealing through a forwarder. I think the problem is other way around. Principles are mighty. The exporters are big. The shipping lines don't want to take a panga, means a fight or a battle with the exporter who is too big. And that's why they want to scapegoat us. That's the real situation, not because the shipper is not available. So we are soft targets and we have to remain in business and they know that and that is why they, you know, arm twist us. That's even what I feel, you know, and we, we then, you know, succumb to that. Uh, when we have issued a direct BL and like you rightly said that, you know, it's uh, the contract is between the direct shipper and direct consignee with the carrier. Uh, then, you know, they should go after them primarily at least, you know, uh, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So, Amit, let it be part of your agenda for defending ourselves in these cases. Let us take up issue and how sure. collectively and how legally we can defend it. Because uh, fine, there may be a case about how consideration, because there is no consideration, so there is no contract. Shipping line can't impose it on me. They don't pay me anything. There is absolutely no consideration. It is just right. out of, uh, I would say, Forcing us to accept it, otherwise they won't release the container. This is happening. Yeah. Is it legal to issue a bill of lading of dangerous cargo without being trained as per IMDG code? I, I, okay, I, I believe that India is also a signatory of SOLAS. I think there is a yes. provision which is there. And if you do not follow the provisions, I think there would be mandatory provisions which the court would like to do. The question is the document would be legal, but you may have sanctions from the uh, regulatory authority. They are two separate things. So in so far as a document, I don't think it is an illegal document, but there would be sanctions if you are using people who are not doing it. That's the way I would look at it. Okay. The conditions are on the operative part rather than the contractual commercial part. Like if you are handling dangerous goods, to accept dangerous goods, handle dangerous goods, you need to be pre-qualified. So it has nothing to do with the issuance of bill of lading per se, but handling of the goods. Okay. Okay. Uh, the last question on behalf of all the forwarders, which I'm saying, anything specific, what each basic guidelines or basic precautions each one should take or follow? Right, since he's issuing his house bill of lading so that he does not fall into any type of uh, legal issues okay. or any claims or whatever I would say. Just a basic. I, I think that the easiest way is to know your customer, know the cargo which you're doing instead of just saying doing an FAK. Third is make sure that whatever you're looking at the document, uh, you know, the date of shipment, you, you're actually, if you're a forwarder, you'll be loading with some third party, even if you're a contractual carrier. If you're a carrier, you would be having a loading report. So, you know, there are, you know, and, and, you know don't get swayed, but that the vessel is going tomorrow, give me earlier bill. Like there are some checklists which you need to do. The person signing it should be someone different from the person preparing the document. So there is checks and balances. And if you follow all these, which is there, like you cannot, you need to say that I'm not going to accept any ad valor of BL. I'm not going to give any shipped on board BLs unless it has been shipped on board. Uh, I'm not going to give any, uh, what do you say, change in commodity, which is, you know, in, in, in India, I know India, in Indian subcontinent, you have a different system wherein you have something as a shipping bill. In Pakistan, you have goods declaration. The same format, they call it different. So you need to do it. In other jurisdictions, we are not so bothered. The shipper declares we take it at face value. But here you have a system where it is declared because you may fall fall of custom issues there. So if you follow all that, I think it should be okay. I don't see a problem. Mistakes will happen. Life is never, never you can be 100% correct. But if you have the SOPs, you're at least in a better position to deal with issues as they rise. Once you have an issue, deal with it. The majority of issues which I see is when they have a problem, they sit on it. They are not proactive. 
I have actually seen a claim which could have been sorted for about ten thousand dollars in Singapore. It boomeranged to about forty thousand dollars because the forwarder was thinking he's smart. He could have waited to solve it, but it, you know what happens? He's not in control. If you are dealing with it, you are in control. You can minimize it. When you have a problem, agree that is a problem. Deal with it. That's my advice. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're done. Okay. Uh, like to propose a word of thanks. I, on behalf of Amtoy, the WRC. Hereby wish to give my word of thanks to our respected guest, Mr. Jagannathan Muthu, for agreeing to share his knowledge and views on the most important subject, which is the bill of lading and answering all the queries from our participants. Our sincere thanks to our president, Mr. Shantanu Badkamkar, and all the managing committee members and our chapter conveners and co-conveners. For the participants, just for the information, we have four chapters under Omtoy, which is East, West, North, South, and each one is headed by a convener and assisted by a co-convener. I, on behalf of Amtoy, would like to request all the members to come and join Amtoy as a member. You can always, you can also refer to our website. Our sincere thanks to all the panelists and all the participants from all over India and Singapore, for sure. Thank you so much. Jagan, thank you thanks a lot. It was a pleasure having you over. Chantan sir, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Amit, thanks. Thank okay. you, thank you. Thank you. We look thank forward you. to have another day. Yes, we'll Jagan, we'll be in touch. We'll definitely we'll uh, look we'll forward to something more again. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Have a great thank day. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.